Welcome everybody to another episode of Trek Talk with Tech and Kirk. I'm Techman16. And I'm Strange Kirk. And today we're going to be talking about Discovery, Star Trek Discovery Season 3, Episode 1. Warning, spoilers are ahead. We're going to talk about the entire episode, uh, give a synopsis, and then talk about what we liked and what we didn't like. And joining me now is Amergan from Amergan Gaming, man. How you doing? How's it going, Tech Man? Oh, you know, it's going. Watching Star Trek. How about you? Yeah, we uh we we a couple of us got together and we, we, we watched uh, we watched episode one of season three. Um I was happy enough with the wee group that we had. Um I, I liked it well enough. I don't know about you. Um I, I suppose my expectations weren't very high in the first place. Um we had <laughs> we, you know, we had done that last recording where we were doing that bit of anticipation towards it and uh, we talked about how but I, certainly from my point of view, it was a case of uh, looking at it and going, shit, I should have I should have reviewed season two a little bit before we started recording and and that. But I had no incli- inclination to go and rewatch them. You know, it hadn't grabbed me enough to to kind of get the bug, if you know what I mean. Um, sure. But but having watched that first episode, I was pleased. You know, I know we'd ha- we've had a chat about this a couple of times. We, we certainly we talked a little bit about it after we'd had that little watch group together and um there was a couple of things that jumped out to me um that the outstanding thing now we're nearly a week i suppose gone um the the next episode uh, from from time of recording here the next episode for us is uh, tomorrow um i haven't gone and rewatched it yet again uh, you know uh, uh, but in terms of the, the memory of it and what what's standing out for me overall um, I suppose there are two things. Um, I had said this to you. We, we got caught up a little bit. I should have went and checked this as well. I should have done the homework on this. So it'd be be ready for you. Um, and we talked about uh, the episode Gary Seven from the original series. Yes. And uh, what was it was screaming at me a few a few moments there where uh, they seemed to focus in on uh, this gay with a cat. You know, um, it just it, maybe that's just maybe that's just a tip of the hat to cat lovers. I don't know, right? But uh, but when I was looking at that, what was screaming at me was, is this is this like time travel cat race of people like in Gary Seven? You know uh, that that episode where you know he. Uh, you know, at, at the very end of it, I can't think of the actress's name. She went on to have a pretty decent career, but uh, she looks over towards the end of the the episode, and uh, the cat turns into like um, a humanoid yeah. female. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then she looks, she looks back, and she it's a cat again. And all through the episode, Gary Seven had been communicating with this cat. Um, and he, you know, the, from my memory, I should have went back and watched that episode. I recommend anybody listening to go and watch the episode of the original series called Gary Seven and and uh, and, and tell me what they think and leave their comments about this because, uh, to my mind, now maybe they didn't use the language temporal agents. Maybe that was language that came in later on in Star Trek canon. But to me, uh, the concept of what Gary Seven was, he certainly to me he was a, a temporal agent. Um, he was uh, it, there was time travel involved. He was there to protect um, the human race from advancing too fast and things like this, uh, or from making mistakes, certainly, and, and, and things like that. And, and there were other agents who had been killed in an accident, and he had to go and basically uh, get their mission uh, objectives achieved before certain events happened. Um, and all of that, and, and the existence of the cat then as well, uh, just uh, that's what was really screaming at me in Discovery going, are they going down this kind of line with this? Is there something that's going to connect this up a little bit with that? All right, let's pivot to Admiral Jansen. Admiral Jansen, man, how did you like the first episode of Discovery? Season three. I loved it, of course. Um, I I thought there was... A, a lot of stuff that was being thrown at us really fast. And, um, yeah, it was... I actually found myself going back and re-watching and pausing a lot of uh, images to, to look at the detailing. Um, I will say that I really did miss the dynamic with the crew. I think 
the interchanges with the crew members is what I really like about Discovery. So I'm hoping that it really moves along pretty quickly. And I and I love Burnham, and I think Book balanced her really well because it wasn't so much screen time directly on Burnham; it was on on the two of them. He appreciated watching that dynamic kind of grow. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's a, that's a very good perspective. I like having the positivity of some people to balance out, you know. My and Kirk's negativity and somewhat amorous. <laughs> That's definitely me. Because you're you're a captain positivity. Is there is there a Star Trek character who's always who's always like positive? Tilly. Uh yeah, I guess Tilly would be always uh, eternal optimist. Which is which is why she's probably one of my favorite characters, and why Morgan and I will debate back and forth all day long about her. Right. Right. Well, you know, this is the power of math, people. <laughs> nice. Um. So, anything that you uh. So, okay. Let let me let me go into the nitty gritty here. Any Easter eggs that you saw that you liked it when you when you uh, backed into the images and stuff? Oh, um. I wouldn't say it was so much of an Easter egg. But I was really focused on, we, oddly enough, on the ship when Burnham comes out of the wormhole and she's in, in the Red Angel suit and she's free falling. She free falls through a destroyed Federation ship. And I was so fixated on that ship because I'm like, it looks like the Discovery. And so I'm pausing and I'm playing through the entire clip of that, looking for the registry number. And I see only an NCC. I could not get a number on it, but it looked like the saucer section of the Discovery. So I'm like, okay, has the Discovery been there for a long time? That's where I was kind of left off with the episode. Interesting. But in like all time travel phenomena, Discovery probably hasn't come through the the time vortex wormhole thing yet. I mean, in, with time travel, they could have been there for a very long time. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Temporal mechanics one on one. Didn't didn't everybody what? take it at the academy? <laughs> exactly. So let me uh, let me go through a synopsis of what happened in in episode one. Um, Burnham comes through the time vortex as was from season two. She collides with a ship operated by a courier named Cleveland Booker or, or book as, as he, as he goes by, they crash land on a, on a planet nearby where, uh, there is a sort of a trading, uh, post, uh, for basically couriers that are, that is run by. And Dorians and the Orions, because as was figured out, the, the Federation has collapsed because at some point a couple of hundred years ago, or I, I think they said 150 years ago, um, Dilithium blew up for uh, throughout the, the majority of the known yeah, quadrant yeah. called the Burn. We called it the Burn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, starships could not travel through through space and so the federation was practically fell apart it seems like there are various segments of kind of marauder territories that exist and cleveland booker seems to be this heartless individual but he turns out to be a kind of an advanced human who likes life Mm -hmm. and he's able to uh, he's, a, he's a hippie. Come on, like a, let, he's a, he's an environmentalist, environmental activist. Like that's what he is. Like he's trying to protect fucking <laughs> these endangered species. Like he, you know, you modern modern era in, in in our world, he'd be on a fucking Greenpeace ship somewhere. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he he's a a courier hippie who protects animals into their sanctuaries. Um. There's a few tidbits. Uh. Burnham could not contact Discovery because it seems like Discovery had not come through yet. Um, at the same time, uh, 
they stole uh, dilithium from this uh, this marauder trading post in order to power book ship so they could take this creature to the sanctuary. Little little more tidbits. Um, apparently Burnham's tools that she has, the communicator, the the gunner, are antiques, and some and for some reason they are wanted um, as antiques. Um, out uh, temporal uh, temporal technology was outlawed apparently uh, about a hundred years before the start of the story. Uh, the 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 story takes place in the 32nd century. So I was a little off when I was talking to DJs about um, it being between uh, modern Trek and uh, Daniels' temporal agents that existed in the 31st century as seen in Enterprise. So I was mistaken. This, to this story actually takes further beyond that. Now, let's get into some of the meaty stuff. Like, uh, are there things that you keyed in on, Amergan, that stood out to you and you're like, oh, my God, this is... Or are there things that stood out to you and you're like, oh, this is really, really cool? I, I really liked the idea that um, the, the guy that we see in the introduction uh, was a wee bit lost at the start going... Who, who is this guy when he wakens up and he goes through his kind of his daily routine? Um, yes. I was going, what, what is this? Right. Um, but, you know, it, we're only getting into it. We, we let it slide. And then we come into the events of that you spoke about there where Burnham collides with the ship and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I suppose that the first thing that gave me a cringe moment was she kept talking to herself. She like, you know, she was like, walk and things like that and i know i think it was yourself or somebody had said well that's maybe something to do with the vulcan thing and you know her kind of forcing herself to go through the pain barrier and all of that kind of thing but it was like i don't know it just i, I, just, I just had a cringe moment where i don't know it felt a bit forced or something like that um and i went no it's not gonna go down this road it's not gonna be all about burnham like it, there's there's an awful lot of um emotion for somebody who's supposed to be from burnham for somebody who's supposed to be practically Vulcan, you know, um, and it just, I don't know, it just doesn't fit for me, her character, I'm not in love with it anyway, but um, as it went on, and I started to kind of get the grips with what it was they were trying to do, and, you know, and these new characters that we're meeting, and all of that kind of stuff, um, I really liked, I had a moment, a really positive moment, um, that I suppose it made it for me, it made the show for me, apart from what I talked about with Gary Seven and all, where I was kind of getting a little bit excited about the possibility that some of this was going to tie in uh, original series uh, storylines. Um, when Burnham met that gay who we seen at the very, very start, who was like the caretaker of the, the Federation flag, and it was almost like it was a, 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 a it was the family tradition, it was almost like it was a religious thing that he went through, um, where it was sacred. And, uh, and when Burnham met him, um, it, 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 it sparked off this kind of thing where he now can fly this flag and the Federation is going to be restored. Um, and and we had talked a little bit about you know the breakdown of the Federation and all of this and the different reasons why, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of that uh, as the season progresses. Um, I, I, I had a real positive feeling about how they done that. Um, maybe it was because it was well acted, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, I liked that, that character of the guy who was protecting, if you like, the flag, and he was like the, one of the only ones left. That that appealed to me for whatever reason. Um, the rest of it, you know, it, it's too early for me to really judge, or for any of us, I suppose. But um, in in the last week since we, I've watched the first uh, episode, um, talking to different people, and I suppose listening to what other people are saying, somebody suggested that uh, they basically taken the the Andromeda storyline, the Gene Roddenberry uh, Andromeda story. Um, so I went and I rewatched the first episode of Andromeda, and sure enough. Um, it seems as though they have taken uh, taken the Andromeda storyline, the things falling. Now, the details, like, it's 300 years in Andromeda and things like that, you know. Um, um, there was a massive war, uh, instead of it being the burn, as, uh, as we've learned about it, that, that caused the, the breakdown. But 
the the basic concept of uh, the the Commonwealth in Andromeda uh, breaking apart, and now this ship um, in a different time is going to be it's the ship that's going to go out there with this ragtag crew and restore this amazing idea. It's it's very much what it looks like we're getting here in uh, in Discovery. Um, but I reserve a certain amount of judgment on that. But I'd recommend people go and watch Gary Seven. People go and watch uh, the first episode of Andromeda, and uh, and make up their own minds as well. So that that is a very astute observation. I I, I think that you're spot on. Um, I haven't seen Andromeda in years. Um, it was an interesting show. It wasn't my cup of tea, but. I definitely understand where you're coming from because it was a Gene Roddenberry original. Um, I also did like the nostalgia aspect that, you know, this uh, Starfleet non-commissioned officer brings and he's like, I couldn't um, I couldn't uh, hold the flag because I'm not a commissioned officer. And, you know, then, it, then the flag flies. It was very kind of a, a, you know, a patriotic kind of scene, which... I don't know why it drew emotion out of me, but it did. But that was probably the only scene that I really enjoyed in the first episode. Um, I'm going to run through a list of things really quickly. Other people can pick up on it. Uh, Number one, the very first scene, Burnham flies, hits a ship, and both her and the ship fly towards the planet. That's not how physics works. That's... uh, that's saying a mosquito hitting your car will cause your car to fly backwards into other cars as you're on the freeway. Um, all, of, all of a sudden, the, the suit itself is built with heat shields and impact shields, and it has to be rebooted for some reason. It crash lands into the planet, and then Burnham walks away with nothing but like you know, um, like some sort of pain in her side, which is kind of like flying down a terminal velocity. It's not supposed to, uh, uh, it's going to leave a bigger mark. Um, and did you catch, I, like maybe I'm a bit slow on the uptake, but did you, uh, she sent the ship back up to the wormhole, or sorry, the suit, she sent the suit back up to the yeah, wormhole. To destroy uh, what, it. So it can never be used again. So now she's tethered herself to the 32nd century. But I didn't get like maybe I, that's what I'm saying. Maybe maybe I I should have went and rewatched season two. Was the intention always to destroy the suit? I I don't remember. That's a that's a very good point. That's a, that's a very the, good the, point. they I know why like why would you destroy the suit uh, unless it was your express intention from the start? I I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's discovery. Don't don't question it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly why we're here. <laughs> How's it going, Kirk? Uh, What's up, buddy? Anyways, let, uh, my my gamut. Um, why is the uh, why is the tools that Burnham brings so valued? I never understood that. They never described it. They just let her into this compound because she's got antiques. There, I got the impression that. It wasn't that they were so valued. It's just that they might have value because they are antiques. Right. You know, in, in, the, in the same sense that if you went to any trading post, there, everything and anything is for sale. And there will be a market for antiques as opposed to it being highly valued. I understand that. But Book, Booker was, was willing, you know, armed confrontation with the guards until somebody else from upstairs said, let her through. And then he tried to pawn them off onto an Orion. And she's like, go away. I don't, I don't need this junk. So I, but it suggested to me, like when he said to her about her, a, uh, her insignia and her badge, a comms badge, um, and basically take that off or cover that up or whatever it was. And, you know, get out of that uniform and, and whatever it suggested to me that, um, there are still those around there are those elements that exist that are very very interested in either what remains of the federation or may have knowledge of time travel you know temporal technology and that's been outlawed that there are those nefarious characters that are probably still using this technology and it's very possible that 
these people are back and forward in the timeline um and so somebody from that timeline it would be illegal to be using technology that allows you to travel uh, back and forward in time but that there are those that are out there that we'd be doing it on the black market and um and somebody like burnham showing up with her federation outfit and comms badge that's very old and outdated that that would spark off a, a certain type of interest in these kind of murky um backwater establishments that to him um, trade in all sorts of illicit goods you know um I'm, I'm sure we're going to see something along those lines that there are people who know more than they're letting on and they're dealing in stuff that they shouldn't be well you i think also you could also look at one of the other obvious elephants in the room that may be that that the federation might not be well liked among certain circles you know um it, it may be that there are it, and of course we don't know yet because it's still too early in the show but there may be certain elements at least in that area of space where she's at um that the you know he's basically like I don't want to be seen with you because you know maybe the people that I deal with are not big fans of the federation historically so you know it could could be something like that as well and I was suggesting to Tech Man a little while ago there, Kirk, I think it was just before you joined us, um, about this feeling of the gay who's the caretaker or the non-commissioned officer of the Federation who had the flag and was protecting the flag, um, that it was all, there was almost religious undertones there. Um, maybe the people who were left still believing in the ideals of the Federation, maybe they're zealots. No, maybe these are people who take it a little bit too seriously um, and go to extreme lengths to protect. Um, in which case, zealots in any society um, are, are they're not to be trifled with if they're if they're even, if they're organized in any kind of way. Oh, ab absolutely, and I mean they did a good job as far as this is, as far as the show is concerned. I think I'm obviously not a big Discovery fan. However, I, I think the a lot of the ideas that they're using to me it's just not all that appealing but they did a great job in writing it that it kind of hooks you i don't even like discovery but i still feel the need to watch the next episode i got to know what's happening and they definitely did a good job of presenting it with this this uh this shadowy mysticism almost like well what's gonna happen next tune in next week to find out and i i don't know i feel like i feel like in in that aspect they the writers did a great job of kind of putting the hook in your mouth this is going to be the problem you see this is the problem they had with previous discovery episodes was that they do get you hooked a little bit only to kind of let you down a little bit again so build you up buttercup but then, it's, then they let you down when it's like oh shit i was hoping for a little bit more than this <laughs> there's a there were there were a lot of criticisms um about discovery excuse me i'm not the only one you know i talked to a bunch of other people i know they're star trek fans and they're like man the Klingons look ridiculous, and this is ridiculous, and the technology is ridiculous. So maybe um, it's that maybe the writers and the producers listened to people for once, and was maybe they're kind of like, well, we need to maybe ramp it up. And that's what I'm hopeful for, you know, because there have been plenty of shows where you watch the first one or two seasons, and you're like, this show's garbage, and you end up watching another season, and you're like, wow, they turned this around, you know, this show's yeah, fair point, fantastic. Yeah. You know, they did that with, to me, they did that with the, the with the remake of Battlestar Galactica. I thought the first season was trash. And then, lo and behold, they kind of, right. they kind of well, came into their own and they were able to find their it, stride. Let's keep it to Discovery. So, uh, going back to Discovery a little bit. Yeah, I get, get started on Battlestar Galactica. We'll be here all night. <laughs> the, the one thing I, I really didn't like was the introduction of the burn. I, I really want to understand i i know it'll probably be sprinkled out throughout the season but th just the offhand comment that they made that the dilithium became unstable or the dilithium crystals became unstable and then they exploded which caused all sorts of devastation and wreaking havoc throughout the quadrant it just um it's such a far-fetched scientific phenomena that just, it boggles my mind and somebody will have to explain to me in, in a in a logical cohesive pattern so i researched this for for quite some time because i'm often talking about discovery and there's me and centilli who absolutely loves star trek discovery and a lot of people that don't 
And so I really want to take that canon discussion of Dilithium exploding and really break it down to what the Star Trek canon geeks will, you know, will want to talk about. And I think it's so there is stuff there that says depending on how Dilithium grows, it it can become explosive. Depending on how many times it's recrystallized, it can explode. It's rare to find in the universe at all. The Federation had been going on for a very long time, so had they been recrystallizing the the same dilithium over and over and over, causing it to be explosive. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because all dilithium blew up at the same time right and so i think the burn is still really up in the air the the one thing that that comes to mind was was there a change in the basic laws of nature for this universe that caused it to explode all at the same time really don't know but what I what I will say is that there is information in canon that suggests that it is an explosive. Yeah, we we t- we talked previously about uh, the par- drawn parallels with the real world. Uh, you know, the Federation, the United States, you know, things like that. Um, the real world, in my mind, the real world equivalent of dilithium would probably be oil. You know, in the in the in the real world, um, and it would be like saying that all of the oil all of a sudden just burned up all over the world and we had no oil. Therefore, planes are grounded, ships are only able to move in a limited capacity, all of this kind of stuff. You have to go, go to different technologies to be able to power your vehicles. Um, what would it take for every drop of oil on the planet to just up and go up in flames? Like, you know, it's just in certain regions, yes, that might happen. But yeah, the entire world across the universe, the entire world. I mean, we're drawing the parallels to, to to real world, and then bring it back to the Star Trek universe. The entire like, universe is a big fucking place. Like right. Know? Well, yeah. If if you listen to Lower Decks, it, the universe is kind of a small place in the Star Trek universe. But I I would have to say that it it has to be some sort of sabotage. Like somebody sabotaged all the dead lithium crystals or all the dead lithium mines somewhere somehow to create this resonance effect that could lead to something called the burn i it that that introduction to me was probably the least star trek thing i have ever seen in any of these shows it's different than that according to memory alpha which is what all the canon gates use when dilithium is expended it can be recrystallized to be useful again. However, you change the dilithium when you do that. And if you're not doing it precisely correct, an explosion can happen. And we've seen this in Voyager, where they had to recrystallize their dilithium. We've seen this in a lot of different Trek. We've seen in Trek where dilithium grows differently and becomes an explosive. So it's a little bit different than oil, whereas oil is used and then it's gone. Dilithium can be reused. Okay. You know, and uh, I probably don't have uh dive deep down into memory alpha to remember all those instances. Um, I do remember the, the, the instance with the Enterprise D and Geordi LaForge creating a hologram of... Uh, uh, Leah Brahms to get out of that uh, ancient minefield that would sap all their energy. And I think right. that, that episode had to do with some sort of a, a reorientation of the dilithium matrix, if you will. The sabotage thing's an interesting one because if you did have if you, if you did have a, a, a civilization, we'll say, that was capable of sabotaging the dilithium reserves if, if if you had the dilithium reserves all around the galaxy mapped um and and there was a civilization that had the capacity to go and sabotage all of them it would be a, a very very 
uh, clever way of changing the balance of power now, forever. Tech, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't he mention, didn't Book mention that he didn't say it was all the dilithium, right? I think he said nearly all or almost all or something like well, that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. the verbiage used? Well, because all the ships run on that. They all still run on dilithium, but it's like yeah. he said that I don't, I don't recall the exact words, but it was like a massive event where almost all of that lithium just went up and went boom. And it was like, what? Right. So, right. And then, so, and I think if I'm not mistaken, wasn't when she was whacked out of her mind on dope and they were in the, the or in the truth serum and they were in the gunfight or the firefight there didn't she run into that room to try to get the dilithium weren't those dilithium crystals yes, yes she so got it a bunch like, of that, it like, seems like obviously obviously what little is left is obviously like held on to by the powers that be the orion syndicate type people and maybe that's you know so there's still some left but it's just such a scant amount that it's all rationed and held on to by the by the upper echelons of the this newer universe in which we find ourselves right so again, I the concept to me, I'm really, really not a fan of, and I, I just, I hope I, I don't get severely disappointed by the explanation, or in true discovery fashion, like in season two, that entire plot just gets dropped. Like they'll mention the burn, and yeah. and it'll be some sort of different event, and then you go back to episode one and realize, wait a minute, wasn't this whole thing about that lithium? And then they'll probably they'll yeah. probably say, oh, it was a temporal incursion field that uh, inverted all the warp fields and shit and caused an explosion throughout the galaxy. And you're like, wait, what the fuck? Yeah, we're just meant to accept that this happened and not question it uh, just to allow for them to be able to take this story in another direction. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would be very disappointing. All right. Um, and, and then obviously, you know, find the, the hippie thing where you grab the uh, the space worm and you put you put it in another space worm sanctuary so they could reproduce like yeah that's cool um i thought that was you know kind of to the to the you know environmental aspect of of contemporary society um although the yeah what what worries me that you could be right there is we had talked when we had done the uh, the, the 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 we bit uh, when we were anticipating the first episode and we talked about the possibility that because the discovery uses the mycelium network to uh, travel, that that makes it the only ship that can possibly tr uh, cover vast distances um, in existence. So uh, that's what will be the the key factor in making discovery like like Andromeda, the ship Andromeda. It will it was it's the, one of the only ships of its kind that will be left um, in that in that story. So uh, discovery will be much the same. It'll be the only ship that'll be able to do those uh, those big journeys and tie up all the the ends of the Federation together again. Um, and it worries me that that's the concept they're going with. And so they needed a reason to be able to, you can imagine these writers sitting down in a room and going, right, we want Discovery to be like Andromeda. And, but how are we going to do it? Because like, there's so many ships out there using dilithium. Well, how about we just destroy all the dilithium? I love it. And then that's it. <laughs> you know? And then, yeah. And then they go, they go to the bar and they tie one on. Have you guys covered, I mean, have you guys talked about the fact that the, uh, the, the space wizardry monk plant praying aspect that book did and his forehead lit up like a christmas tree and then there was this blue plant and we haven't we haven't touched that yet that was the next part of the journey i was i was gonna go on the james bond type scene first where the the villains can't shoot the protagonists even though they're like five feet away yeah because apparently they're stormtroopers yeah <laughs> that's exactly what they are and the stupid hand cannons it's like oh okay <laughs> Well, replace the phasers with hand cannons, because you know, future. That's the it's the if it's, it's the equivalent of the thirty second century blunderbuss. It just <laughs> he just point in one general direction, just pull the trigger, just don't aim. <laughs> so that that was uh, oh, and we we got a uh, we got a cameo from the Morn species. I can't remember. Uh, I I did I did notice that. I thought that was kind of I thought that was kind of cool. But didn't you discover something about that? What the Morn species? Yeah. Me? No. Didn't, didn't you? Yeah, I thought that, that you mentioned something about somebody said something about the Morn, and then there's one that shows up, and you're like, wait, what? 
um i don't i can't remember what they're called anymore um uh but um oh the and then the villains themselves um are from like star trek the motion picture as as somebody pointed out online and I'm like, okay, that's that's cool. They're, I mean, that that's what's intriguing to me about Discovery is that they'll they'll look into canon, and they'll look into the obscure details and find something obscure like like that sort of Easter egg, but they won't pay attention to the big overarching storylines that Star Trek was known for, or or that people cared for. And yeah, so- it, it it seems like uh, the the pattern, it, and it's not just with Discovery. It's with a lot of the modern TV shows that are trying to reinvent or, or capitalize on on classic or you know cla- classic kind of shows that were out there, um, or cult shows that were out there. And it's like some executive walks into the room, gets a focus group together of fucking nerds like us who will happily go and be paid to watch reruns of fucking Star Trek till, till we're fucking falling asleep, like. And uh, we'll take a couple of notes, we'll all go in, we'll do our focus group, we'll sit there and we we'll go, I love this idea, I love that idea. We prepare all of our stuff, we'll throw it all in in a big focus group. Somebody's sitting there with a fucking flip chart and going, yeah, I like it, I like it, I like it. And they're adding all these things together and they draw a big circle and they've all these lines coming out of their fucking circle, a bit like Scarporan ship, you know? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah. How do we add all? How do we add all of this together? And they're just, and the person that's actually responsible for tying it all together hasn't got the first fucking clue what they're doing, and they're relying on the nerds that's feeding them this information that's coming up with great ideas, but the person who's actually sitting down to tie it all together has no passion or knowledge for it. It's like what J.J. Abrams done. Like, let's face it, J.J. Abrams is a fucking dick. Like, I don't like what he done with Star Wars or Star Trek because, but he's got a great fucking formula and he knows what he's doing, so you have to give him credit. But at the end of the day, the man hasn't got the first fucking clue what he's doing. He's just reinventing old shit and he's going, yeah, I like it, I like it. It's going to be catchy. It's going to be flashy. Let's do it. Let, you know, the punters are going to love it and kids are going to rewatch it. And I can't fault the idea like that new generations maybe going to be attracted to this i can sit with my daughter and i can watch newer trek because it's trendy or newer star wars because it's trendy um and and her peers are are, are watching this and uh, you know it's acceptable i can't really sit down and watch the original series with her because she just doesn't get it like it'll take a few years you know um so I, i'm not entirely uncomfortable with it but i just have this feeling that the people that are responsible for tying together the storylines and for ultimately doing the final edits on them they haven't got a fucking clue what they're at Right, so it's going to be. Sorry, that's my random. <laughs> no, no, and that and that's a valid that's a valid concern because you you see what modern television is like with with all those um uh those the the James Bond chase scenes, you know that's that's not Star Trek. There's no there's no James Bond chase scenes with with hand phasers and firing blindly and nowhere, and then at the end of it, like you know, it's it's the same. Okay, James. We have you cornered. Oh, look at this giant blob monster that's going to eat me because we spent too too long talking about our evil plot and that gave us enough time to get destroyed. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think I think I think Amergen touched on the on a very valid point. It's like it seems like they found they did their research, but then they came along and they were like, "All right, well, let's modernize it." And let's figure out a way to tie all this together. And it's like almost like there's a guy in the background going, but excuse me, but no, shut up. But no, that's not shut up. It's going to be great. And ho- hopefully that's not the case. But unfortunately, like, as you said, it seems like that's the way it's unfolding. Right. Because ne- next episode, we'll probably see an Ocompen working together with a uh, w- with like a, a, a Tellarite. And, you know, it'll be like the, the short and the uh the short people with the short life span people because you know let's pair them together they got short in their description and then they're going to be some sort of like badass raiders that want to uh avoid you know people coming into their territory and it's going to be like the void episode where they take everybody's dilithium it just it just seems like they're trying to reinvent the wheel here is what they're trying to do and it's the, the star trek was never broken it, it was never broken. It didn't need to be fixed. I understand putting a new face on it for an update, for a facelift to attract new fans and so forth. I mean, let's face it. I mean, 
there's not a lot of new Star Trek fans, and they're trying to bring them in. And so I, I, I get that, but you have to find a balance, and we've talked about it before, I won't spend a bunch of time on it, but you have to find a balance between putting a facelift on something, but allowing the old to show through, because that is the essence of Star Trek. Without that, all you have is some space show with space wizards and light-up foreheads and hand cannons and plants and space worms that you call Star that you that you just you slap a Star Trek name on it and it's just it's not you're kind of just shafting the old fans because we're all sitting here going that's not how this works that's not how any of this works that's not how this is supposed to work in the universe we know our universe we know uh you know the realm that we in which we operate which is Star Trek and that's why we're all here and they go back to the J.J. Abrams thing, Kirk. You know, like he has proven that a, a new audience can be created by doing this. Um, it can't be argued with. Um, he has he has proven it, even though he did shit all over. For me, like when 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 he reversed the scene between Kirk and Spock, like he just took one of the golden moments in uh, ever in Star Trek between Kirk and Spock. And he just shit all over it. Instead of coming up with something new, he just re- he just took it and regurgitated it in a different way. And it was like you have just fucking you have just insulted that that golden moment. Like um, and, and but most new fans won't get that. But you know, again, and he done the same thing with Star Wars. He just you know he just done done the same thing again. You know, um, regurgitated it in a different way. Um, but if you look at what they done with Star Wars, like somebody else came out and done it properly. When when they done the Mandalorian, for example, Mandalorian's fucking amazing. You know, it's fucking uh, it is one of the best Star Trek I have seen in fucking ages, and it's got no real lightsabers and it's got no real Jedi or any of this kind of stuff going on. But it's fucking Star Wars because it was done properly and it was done by people who were authentic and knew their trade. You know. Um, I'm crying out for somebody to come along and do a Star Trek like that. And then, and then there's no, sh- there's no shortage of uh, morale, morality storylines that we have now in our current, and you know, political environment, whether it be in Ireland or the United States or other parts of the world. You know, there's no shortage of of parallels that could be drawn and used in the future and how people operate and and uh, and put a face against what we currently are today instead of um okay yeah we're in the future but but we're now in a a post-apocalyptic federation world system where it has to be rebuilt you know it's it's it's, uh it's it's a very kind of um isaac asimov type writing like it's very foundation (laughs) series You know, where where everything. That's actually a fair point. Yeah, that's a fair point. I I I did I did get that feeling as well. I should have mentioned it earlier. Is I got that feeling about the foundation just for a wee moment when I was watching episode one. I just got this kind of like, okay, is there so is there like a secret thing group that's that's here somewhere that are keeping it go keeping the whole thing going? What this idea of the federation, but they can't really reveal themselves because it's all fucked if they do. Which is that? That's the foundation, you know. I, I love the foundation, by the way. I love Isaac Asimov. Uh, I've read those books, and uh, you know, I, I think they're amazing. But um, it's not Star Trek, you no, know. It's, it's 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 basically borrowing sci-fi, and it's it's reusing old sci-fi tech, you know, techniques, and trying to present a story in a different way. And it's it's coming off. I mean, again, we're a, a disclaimer, everybody. We're only episode one, right? There's there's like twelve more to go. But just judging on episode one, and it's unfair to do so to the series without watching a few more. But still, we're you know we we've, we've gone this, down this path with Discovery of two seasons before. You know we we've gotten excited or kind of meh about the first episode or or what it entails from the previous season, and and all of a sudden we get this like kind of hype and build up, and we're gonna watch because it's Star Trek, and then they come back and like some stupid explanation like. Hey, what was the point of the seven signals? Uh, uh, I don't know. It's for Burnham to, to you know, show us path stuff before she whisks away into the future. 
All right, we've gone ranting long enough. Um, Amergen Kirk, any final thoughts for episode two? I will. I'll. I'll let Amergen get the last word. I'll go ahead and say that <clears throat> I did. I as as critical as I am of Discovery, and you know, as much as I am not that big of a fan, the actors do a great job. I think. Uh, I think there's some good acting. Um, I mean, not like the scenes that are being played out, but there's some good acting. Um, and again, th- it seems like with this new season, it's almost like it's almost like a new show because there's in this first in this first episode, there's nothing that's familiar except for Burnham. That's the only thing that is familiar. And Morn. And 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 yeah, and Morn uh, and the Morn guy. And so that's the only thing that's familiar. So I think based on that. They have an opportunity to, obviously the show's already done, they're about to start filming season four, but they have an opportunity, they, did, they had an opportunity to kind of reinvent themselves and to kind of redeem themselves, and in, just like Amergen said, I'm going to reserve a lot of judgment until I see more of it to see which direction they're going. Now, it may be that we get to, to episode two, what, tomorrow, and then we go... Okay, yeah, no, this is complete trash. There's no recovering for it. But I will wait until then. I think they have potential. The acting is good, so at least there's that. Amergan, what do you got? Yeah, I'll just pick up on something that we didn't talk about that Kirk mentioned about um, the gay with the plant growing and the thing coming out of his forehead and being able to commune with these animals and all of that kind of stuff. I'm not entirely uncomfortable with that because we've seen strange and wonderful things emerging out of every episode of Star Trek that we hadn't seen before anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm not against these kind of things happening and going, all right, that's another species that can do these things that are out there in the universe somewhere. No problem with that. Um, I would say that the Andorians, they fucked about with how the Andorians looked a wee bit. It was kind of like, is that really necessary? But again, I can get over that. Um, I'm hopeful. Um, I'll give episode one a thumbs up because overall I, I got past the cringe moments and enjoyed it. By the time it was over, I did want to watch the, se- the next episode. Um, I'd probably, in a reserved kind of way, I'd probably give it a six out of ten, um, maybe a seven out of ten, um, which isn't bad compared to some of the other episodes that I've watched of it in season one, season two. Um, and, and 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 I'm hopeful and I'm looking forward. I hope we can get a little watch group together tomorrow and uh, and watch episode two. And fingers crossed that uh, that it picks up a little bit more and that uh, I'm left, like Kirk was saying there earlier, that it's one of these uh, shows that by the time season three comes around, they just really nail it. Before we move on to that, can I just touch on the 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 last fifteen minutes or so? Sure. When they get when they get to the comms array and they meet the individual running that station, that whole moment for me was incredibly emotional. I was like watching it with you guys, but I was like tearing up and I was like holding back the tears and I'm like, Oh my God, it was incredibly emotional, but it wasn't emotional because of what Burnham was doing. It was emotional to see his dedication to the ideals of the Federation. He lived his entire life hoping someone would finally come. That was cool. I I completely I completely agree with you because I I didn't feel as much emotion as you did, but I did feel you know it's is a very sort of kind of patriotic kind of scene. You know I'm I'm dedicating my life and I've dedicated my life for this and somebody finally finally has the authority to you know put up the flag because I I couldn't. My, couldn't put myself to do it because I, I live by its rules because my father lived by these rules. Right. So I, I agree with you there. I think, I think that scene was very well done. Out of, out of all the scenes, you know, where, where you had James Bond scenes where you couldn't shoot straight, um, except for the good guys, they could shoot straight. And, and all <laughs> the weird, weird laws of physics that occurred about a tiny little Blip hitting a ship and and knocking it into a into a planet and then walking away from a from a head-on collision at terminal velocity with nothing but a you know backache. Uh, that was probably the most 
Star Trek. That was Star Trek. That was a Star Trek scene. Right. That was that was a glimpse of Picard. That was a glimpse of Cisco at his best. That right there, CBS, if you're listening to this, that is what everyone wants. More. More of that. Um and <laughs> I was watching uh, another breakdown of the video from several YouTubers. And um, one thing they had said is, um, how does Burnham survive everything? And I'm like, (laughs) really? How did Janeway get flung 70,000 light years in a little science vessel, fight, through the erosion, <laughs> through the bore, and species eight four seven two, eight four seven seven two, <laughs> the Vidians, this little science ship, there ain't no Enterprise. How did she survive? And same thing with Kirk. Same thing with Picard. And same thing with Cisco. Um, these these leads in Star Trek will always be superhuman. Um. It, it, it's an analogy to uh, Cisco and Picard getting into starship fights as you're driving a car and getting into accidents all the time. And you can mm-hmm. walk away from, from the car accident. But Burnham is always unprotected. Right? She's always had a, a suit on for whatever reason. It's like, it's like riding a motorcycle 300 miles per hour and you're constantly getting into accidents on your motorcycle and walking away. I think that is what the essence of, of you know, like, dude, she's kind of exposed in the vacuum of space all the time. How does she survive it all? <laughs> but I, I, I just think it's the lead of Star Trek is invincible. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly it. But uh, I mean, it's, it, it's like, it's, it's more believable. You're having a space battle, right. And you, and you survive the space battle as opposed to like, a, you crash land planet with just a space suit. Yeah, and that's and that's really the other thing I noticed, and I will I will definitely get on the disco bashing ba- bandwagon for this one. Is we need starships. <laughs> 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 Develop some freaking starships for this show, for the love <laughs> of God, CBS. I don't know what is wrong with you. Develop Federation starships that exist. And not like the fleet in Picard, where they were all the same thing. <laughs> where they just copy and pasted everything. It's like exactly. One ship. Oh my god, that book ship! I was like, "What is this? This, this is a luxury cruise liner." <laughs> <sighs> oh. All right. So, any thoughts going into episode two? So, episode two, I'm hoping that we're going to see the Discovery. I'm hoping we are not going to have to endure another Burnham-only episode. <laughs> but that's the way it's looking. Uh, it's, it's possible. Yeah. It's possible. I did. I did want to mention something though, and that is um, in Star Trek canon. Uh, so this takes place about a hundred years later after Daniel, and from Enterprise. Mm-hmm. So that means to me that Daniel should have been around the time of the burn, or at oh. least very close, and that there is a temporal agency that did a bunch of time travel because Daniels was a temporal agent. So um, they kind of hand waved that. If you, I don't know if you picked up on it. They kind of hand waved that saying all temporal technology was banned. Right. So obviously they can't time travel legally. But when is, <laughs> when is the prime directive ever prevented anybody <laughs> in Starfleet from doing anything legal? Romulan. Oh, well, exactly. And and I did mention this in, in the chat room in your server, but I still want to know exactly where is Romulan Tech? 
um, speaking specifically to using a quantum singularity for warp drive. Um, honestly, if everything has been gone for 120 years, wouldn't they fall back on some antiquated technology? That's what I'm curious about. And assuming the Romulans are part of the Federation by now. That's that's a stretch. That might be a stretch. What, what part's a stretch? That the, the Romulans are part of the Federation. They should be. Timeline-wise. Oh, you mean like individual Romulans can be within the Federation? Because the Romulan Empire blew up or something? Depending on what what story you're looking at, a lot of the writing that was done, um, when you take a look at stuff like Star Trek Online, which I would say is not, I don't think it's technically canon. However, I don't think it is. They, they have written the stories showing the alliance between all of the powers. And especially with the destruction of Romulus, I'm curious to see what happened with them. I see. But I'm I'm really curious why why they're outlawing time travel. Oh no. No, it's it's gonna feed into a larger storyline saying time travel caused the burn of the dead lithium because of unstable time flux matrix that affects <laughs> the resonance frequency of dilithium crystal. <laughs> but no, I, I I'm definitely looking forward to to when we see the discovery. Alright. That's that's good. That's good. Um I like that. On that note, I just want to remind everybody that Discovery Season 3 is streaming now on CBS All Access. We will be reviewing every episode on this channel. I want to thank my guests, Amergan and Admiral Jansen. Please, if you haven't, go check out their, their channels. They have full of great STFC content. And we'll be back with more reviews of Star Trek Discovery. This has been Trek Talk with Tech and Kirk. And we'll see you guys next time.